Welcome, welcome. I'm Jonathan Friedman, and this is The Common Room, PEN America's conversation series about free speech, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. PEN America's mission is to celebrate creative expression and defend the civil liberties that make it possible. And I invite those of you in attendance today to consider joining our national membership of writers, journalists, scholars, and their allies in support of our mission. Today, we'll be talking with leaders of TRHT Campus Centers, uh, sponsored by the Association of American Colleges and Universities to tackle the topic of race, reconciliation, and free speech on campus. I'm delighted to be joined by an esteemed panel led by Tia Brown McNair, Vice President of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Student Success, and Executive Director of the TRHT Campus Centers at the AACNU. Hi, Tia. Hi, Jonathan. Nice to be with you today. Welcome. Uh, we're joined by Punihei Leip, the inaugural Native a Hawaiian Affairs Program Officer and Director of the TRHT Campus Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Aloha, Jonathan. Good morning from Hawaii. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, and at 6 a.m., thank you so much. Uh, Cynthia Neal Spence, Associate Professor of Sociology at, at Spelman College and Director of the Social Justice Fellows Program. Good morning, Jonathan. It's great to be here with you and the rest of the panelists. Welcome, Cynthia. And finally, Kyrie O. Williams, who presently serves as the director of Austin Community College's uh, Austin Community College District's Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center. Welcome, Kyrie. Good morning, Jonathan, and to the panelists and in America. Thank you for the invitation. So excited for the conversation. Thank you for being here. Um, so before we get to the main topic of the hour. All here are reminded that this is a forum for interaction and open dialogue. We ask that everyone speak to one another with respect and of course, remember to mute when not speaking. We will reserve time for questions from the audience uh, in, towards the end of the program, but those in attendance are welcome to put uh, responses or questions in the chat or in the Q&A throughout the hour. Um, so calls for racial justice, equity, historical reckoning, they are reverberating with new poignancy on campuses in the past year. Yet challenges remain. Uh, the intersections of free speech, academic freedom and bias are as seemingly fraught as ever. Uh, some are expressing concerns that efforts to advance diversity and anti-racism are too dogmatic in their approaches. And we've seen now a wave of state legislators getting involved most recently this week in seemingly forcing the cancellation of a course on diversity and ethics at Boise State University. As professors, practitioners, throughout higher education are looking for models to bridge these differences. I'm excited to hear from those of you who lead these centers on truth, racial healing and transformation to reflect on these themes. I thought we'd start first uh, with a question for you, Tia. If you could just tell us a little bit about the background of AAC News TRHT centers. Why are these centers needed? What do they hope to achieve? Great, thank you, Jonathan. I just wanna say AAC and U is just proud and happy to be here sponsoring this workshop with you or this conversation with you. Uh, so a few years ago, the Association of American Colleges and Universities entered into a partnership with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And they, at that time, were launching the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation national effort that was led by Gail Christopher. And she's a visionary and architect behind this work. And Lynn Pasquarella and myself, we had the opportunity to serve on design teams for building out the framework for TRHT. We believe at AACNU because we believe in the value of a high quality liberal education for all students. And again, that's nonpartisan. We believe in liberal education focused on those skills and competencies that prepare students for success in work life and productive citizenship that we were seeing at our institutions that increasing combative nature of speaking and engaging across differences. There was a lack of civility and a lack of truth telling and understanding people's narratives around race. And knowing that we were hearing this from our member institutions and we have AACNU represents all different types of institutions here in the United States and well as internationally too, that they were calling on us to help them think of ways of intentionally providing a framework for those conversations to happen, but also for action to occur. And the TRHT campus centers, our goal is to prepare the next generation of leaders to build just and equitable communities. And in that, there is a national framework that focuses on the narrative about race, racial healing and relationship building, but also dismantling the false belief in a hierarchy of human value through examining our policies and structures through separation, 
the economy and law. And this is a pretty comprehensive approach to how do we engage in this work as we design assignments, as we design what we call in higher education, those high impact practice learning experiences for our students, for them to focus on their common humanity and their interconnectedness as people, but also to be able to engage in deep listening and have empathy for one another. And that's why we use what Gail has coined the RX racial healing circles. And those are our core component. And you're gonna hear from that from our wonderful, some of our wonderful TRHD campus and our leaders. I wish that we had the space right now to invite all of them, all 29 of them to be here with us. But I know that from the three that have volunteered to be with us here with us today, you're gonna to hear about the excellent work that is focused on truth telling, narrative change, and sustained transformation for us to focus more on what unites us instead of what divides us. So Punihe, Cynthia, Kyrie, I thought we could open by asking each of you in turn to tell us a little bit about how you got into this work and what are the distinctive aims of your respective centers. Um, Punihe, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, you know, I always tell this story about how we got involved. Um, it, you know, it literally, the, the announcement came across our screen at, at, at UH Manoa. And um, it was one of those, you know, invitations to apply that I just couldn't turn away from. Um, it, it, there was just something about it, you know, the invitation, especially to imagine um, and to envision a future. And I think that was probably the most powerful part for me. Um, and, and, you know, really the invitation to imagine a future without racism. You know, the question was, you know, imagine your community. What does your community look like when racism has been jettisoned? And I think that that's a really powerful question, especially right now, like you were saying, Jonathan, you know, in a time when there's so much that's, that's challenging us, what's the vision that we're going to create and then hold on to and work towards every single day? And AAC and you and Kellogg's invitation to do that was really powerful. I think something for us at the University of Hawaii at Manoa that we're holding on to, and even and today, you know, fast forward to 2021, that was 2017 when that invitation came out. Um, you know, we can look at the pandemic, we can look at climate change and, you know, biodiversity loss, and, and we can think about all the ways that we need to figure out how we're going to heal our relationships with one another so that we can survive in the earth that we've created. And when we first started this work in 2017, we were really focused on climate change and realizing, especially in the island community, but really anyone on island earth, that we are gonna be underwater, we are going to be warmer, we are going to have these extreme events that we're already having in our, having in our wet weather. We're gonna to have to figure out how we take care of one another, right? How we lift each other up, despite the way we, you know, the differences we might have and, you know, different kinds of backgrounds. What are we gonna do about that so that we can figure out how our kids are gonna to live together on this earth? And so that's kind of the basis and kind of maybe some of the things that make us unique in our approach. Cynthia. Yes, um, very much like Punahe, um, Spelman College was most excited to be invited to participate in the inaugural group of um, TRHT campuses. And um, it was only natural for us to believe that this would in fact be an initiative that would in fact fit with our agenda. Spelman College already had established a social justice program and the social justice fellows program was really designed for students who were interested in merging their intellectual interests with their social justice passions. And so we had students already interested in um, issues like poverty and justice, um, voting rights and advocacy, criminal justice reform, environmental justice and climate justice issues. And so, and clearly at a place like Spelman College, as we even think about our own history, we were founded in 1881. We are historically black women's college. And so discussions about racial justice, gender justice, you know, form, they inform the kind of veins and arteries of our institution. And so when we are engaging with our young women talking about the ways in which they can, in fact, make a choice to change the world, we know that a part of changing the world is, in fact, looking at 
hierarchies of human value and interrogating those hierarchies of human value, using scholarship to inform their understanding of the need for so much community service and so much community activism in these various arenas that the TRHT framework focuses on. And so it was just very natural for us to bring our women together through something that we already had in place um, called the Difficult Dialogue Series, if, which is an intercollegiate um, dialogue among students talking about issues that are grounded in really interrogating the presence of racism, sexism, you know, all of the isms in society, but coming together across campuses to engage in these conversations. And so for us, it was a very natural um, place to, to, in fact, invite and accept an invitation from the um, TRHT uh, program. And we are just really excited about the work that we've been able to do with our students, but also our outreach with the community. Kyrie, so same question. How did you get into this work and what's the distinctive aim of your center? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, ACC Austin Community College has been um, laying the foundation for our True Racial Healing Transformation uh, Campus Center for about three years now. I've only been enrolled for about a year. So I really have to tip my uh, hat to leaders, institutional leaders, both past, past and present that have been a part of this work and um, allowed me to have the platform to help lead this work. Uh, but I think the overall goal of our, our um, center is to be an intentional place and space where we can engage students, faculty, and staff in this important conversation of working across differences to build a better campus community, to build a better community beyond our campus. Um, as we think about you know, what institutions of higher education are, are charged at doing, um, we have these fancy, fancy missions and these fancy verbiages, but essentially we are preparing our students for the next, the next chapter, whether it be uh, further higher education or gainful employment. And from our perspective, we can't do, we don't do that well if we only prepare them for, um, only equip them with what they need to do in the job without equipping them with working with people that are different from them. And that's the reality, that's the new reality. Um, diversity in our country is increasing uh, ever more. And if we don't prepare our students to um, be able to engage across differences, to be able to um, have these important conversations around uh, shaping uh, institutions and corporations and community uh, around changing these policies and practices that have been rooted in, uh, the, the rooted in stereotypes and biases uh, in the past, um, then we're not truly preparing them for that next step. Uh, we also believe that in doing so, we're adding value to who they are as a potential candidate, as a potential employee, as a, as a potential leader. Um, in our work, we also engage faculty and staff because we can't have one center for our students if we're not upholding that as well. Um, so it's all about having an important conversation and being intentional about providing spaces to do so. So I hear, uh, you know, recurring themes in, in all of you talking about your work, conversations, um, speaking truth, um, helping people grow. And I know that listening is also a significant part of this work. Um, so, but I thought maybe we, we, we turn to, you know, the main topic here around thinking about the questions about free speech and race and reconciliation. So, you know, is, are these, these values, these ideas, are they inherently in tension in your work? Where do they arise and, and how do you view them? How do you kind of conceive of them uh, in your day-to-day -day work? And we can start with Kunihei maybe. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think for us in Hawaii, <clears throat> I think one thing that we have to be really clear about, and I wanna, um, I think it adds to the distinctness, but I'm hoping we're not the only ones, is we're really thinking about, you know, all of these concepts from an indigenous point of view. Um, we are looking to, especially Native Hawaiian knowledge, we're looking back basically in order to look forward because it's hard to imagine futures without racism when you've never lived in one, right? Um, but we can look to our past in a time, especially here in Hawaii, but anywhere in the world, really. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper, but um, to find a time when racism didn't exist. And so what was that time like? What can we learn from the value sets from the people of that time that we can bring forward into the 21st century? And so we do look to Native Hawaiian concepts. And one of those concepts is kuleana, this idea of, of you know, the responsibility that we, that's born out of the way we're in relationship with one another. And so when I think about free speech, when I think about you know, your, the terms you're using, reconciliation, race, racism, all these things that are really you know, inter, interconnected, think about how are we going to find ways to be in relationship, right? And so you know, we can think about diversity and equity, which comes up a lot you know, um, in this work as well. And how are we gonna bring the 
number, the, you know, the countless number of diverse views together. We have to make space for people's truth to be heard. We can't just have people who look different. We need their whole diverse stories to come together. And we have to make space. And when we include them wholly, right? I might not completely agree with you, but if I can fully hear you, right? Which again is so important with the listening piece then I wonder what we can find that we are in connection about, that we are in relationship about, ultimately, so that we can figure out the ways we might be able to take care of one another. So I think that's an important frame for the work we're doing here in Hawaii. Um, and we have to be able to tell, speak our truth and tell our stories, right? Because I know that if that's, you know, the four of us um, or five of us sat together, I can't even count, it's early in the morning. Um, you know, if we, if we sat together long enough, we're gonna find ways that we're connected. And that's the power of the racial healing circles, which I know we'll talk about in a bit, but I'll let my colleagues speak. Yeah, and I, I would um, say that it's the, the truth telling part of the engagement that the TRHT framework provides for us that is so meaningful, but at the same time, we're very careful in the ways that we engage the truth telling. Because as we know, and you know, as the stories that you've just shared um, when we opened up with some individuals are not as comfortable with some of the truth telling that we believe is important to the framework. And that truth telling is, may, is sometimes sharing histories or sharing knowledge about histories that perhaps were not even known because we don't fault our, even our students. Again, I'm at a historically black college, but our students, I mean, the, the amount of history, particularly black history that they know is not that vast because they've come up through educational systems that have not, that have silenced the histories of black people or of people of color. And so certainly when I'm talking to my white colleagues, I can't fault them for not knowing because where would you know? You know, even if my own students don't know, the educational systems have not actually provided the necessary truth telling that I believe that will in fact engender empathy. Because you, if you don't know of someone else's experiences, then you cannot necessarily be empathetic to their experiences. And so it's a larger structural issue that we have to also critique beyond the TRHT project, where we really look at our educational systems and how people are being educated about the multiple histories and identities that inform our nation. Um, sometimes this is very difficult. One of the um, most memorable, though, experiences that, that I've had with the TRHT framework was actually um, an engagement we had with senior citizens and um, some of our own students and some of my white colleagues at Spelman College. And in asking very, what we thought were harmless questions about just tell us about your experiences you know, of race. And when some of those senior citizens began to share their stories, not only was it impactful for me or for um, my white colleagues, but my students as well, because again, these were stories that maybe they got a little glimpse of during Black History Month, but they had never really sat down and talked with someone about their stories. And my white colleagues also were very attentive in saying that, you know, it makes a difference when you're actually in the room with someone, comfortable sharing a meal, but just really sharing stories. And so I think that it's very important for us as we move toward race, racial reconciliation, as you mentioned, that, um, and as Punahi um, talked, Punahi shares, that we've got to be able to develop empathy across difference. And a part of that empathy is hearing other individual stories. And so that's been a, a major part of um, this particular initiative. And it's, it's one that we, we value tremendously. And I would just add that, um... Austin Community College has 11 campuses serving nearly 44,000 students. Uh, we are not a monolith as an institution. Our students are not a monolith. Our faculty and staff are not a monolith. We represent just a myriad of cultures and religions and ethnicities and sexual orientations. And then just the whole kind of the whole gamut of diversity 
And I think that's what makes us such a beautiful community. But within that, there's so many opportunities. When I think about the truth part of our work, I think it's really about knowing and understanding and being connected to who we are individually. Um, so what shaped us, what our, our culture, our, our family traditions, our, our community, everything that's been poured into us that, that we bring to this conversation. Because through that, that's, that's how we view this conversation. That's how we view our perspectives around equity and justice and inclusion. And, and through having those conversations, we're able to understand um, the good stuff that's within us and maybe some of the, um, the, the stuff that we need to continue to work, work on, maybe our blind spots. Um, so for example, part of my truth is being a man of color that grew up in a community where everyone looked just like me. Um, so it wasn't until I got to college that I realized that I was, I was holding on to some, to some negative stuff. But I had to work through some stereotypes, some biases, some isms that I was holding myself. And if we don't, we don't, if we don't have those conversations that we're not able to have through that self-reflection and understand where we need to grow as an individual. We can't um, grow our institutions if we're not doing the work on ourselves. We can't grow our communities if we're not doing the work on ourselves. And if we don't provide spaces for our students to do that, then the change doesn't happen. We can't call them the future leaders without shaping them and preparing them to do that work. Um, and when I think about freedom of speech, um, I, I would just add that um, freedom of speech, I, I absolutely support, um, but my voice should never cancel out someone else's voice. Um, so it, 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 there's freedom of speech, but there's consequences to it. And we have to know and understand how we navigate that because we are grooming, especially our students to go out, go out into the world, to serve, to be in corporations, to be in institutions that all have diversity missions. Um, if, if, if that's what we're truly preparing them for, then um, how can they tackle that work? We haven't had that conversation and help them understand that yes, freedom of speech, there's power in freedom of speech, but there's also power in understanding that you have to um, value and acknowledge all voices at the table. Jonathan, can I just jump in real quick? Please, I want yeah. to highlight something that Cynthia and, and Kyrie are speaking to, which is, um, you know, I, I love the way she was saying, you know, we have to be careful, right? Um, and I want, you know, whether you're in Hawaii, whether you're across the United States, you know, the world, I think one thing that's important as we think about, I mean, and of course, within the United States and the idea of free speech, but especially um, is this idea of trauma, the historical and collective trauma that we experience in any, whether it's our little household, our community, our university, you know, our state, our country, um, and that that, you know, and, and both of my colleagues here are speaking to this, we have to handhold people. And I don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> I used to be a college advisor. I love handholding people. I love to be handheld when I was a student. Um, but we really have to recognize that these are muscles, right? To, to, to share and to receive someone else's truth is really a muscle that we have to exercise. We got to strengthen. And it has been damaged, by the trauma we have experienced. It doesn't matter who we are, white, black, brown, whatever color you want to call yourself. Um, and I, I think recognizing that and honoring that and meeting people where they are at and having the skill to meet people where they are at, that's not something that's, that's learned, right? You get, you get training for that. So I think all of those pieces are really important as we think about the way we create spaces to share our truths and to share, you know, have a free speech forum. Um, so I just want to recognize the real human qualities that are a part of that, the emotions that are a part of that, the skill sets that I think um, sometimes we forget, but they're there and we watch them come out every day in different ways. Yeah. So I just thought I would mention that. Yeah, and I would like to just add to that. One of the um, findings from this work and what I share with groups that ask is, oh gosh, we would love for you to come and do a racial healing circle for us. And they, they are very sincere and genuine and they want that, but they believe that that's going to be the one thing that you can do and okay, we've done it. And so we're good. We're, you know, we're embracing diversity and intolerance and we don't need to talk about this anymore. And what I always say is that healing is a process. And it is a process. And so I can't, um, I just want, you know, I share with them, I, say, I have to be very honest with you. I can engage your group in a racial healing circle, but it's just going to scratch the surface if we just do one. And it's so difficult, and, and we try not to make them difficult dialogues, but sometimes difficult dialogues are generated from it. And then you just stop it. And then there's no progress. And so it's really important that we understand it's taken us a long time to get to this place. And it's going to take us a long time to move from this place. And so it is a process. 
but we must in fact embrace the truth, but, but figure out ways to embrace the truth in ways that are manageable and that are sustainable over time. I really, uh, you know, appreciate many of the points being made here, in particular, the one, um, Kari, you were saying about the importance of free speech, frankly, free speech and equality, that if it isn't, um, you know, free speech and opportunities for all to be heard and speak, then it isn't really free speech at all. And, and I want to turn here, I know there is uh, such an enormous range of diversity programs uh, out there. Um, that 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 do different kinds of things and we've seen a growing skepticism of diversity programs you know that they can be effective that they can be uh useful at at i don't know uh, healing society at improving empathy at, at teaching some of the skills that you all are talking about so i was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you see the work of your centers and perhaps of these racial healing circles as um different distinctive um, you know, productive, uh, uh, and, and, and how, you know, what, how they work and why you think they're, they're successful as a model. I think that they can be successful as a model because you are engaging diff groups that represent difference. So you're engaging, you go to a campus and you're engaging administrators, faculty, staff, and students. So you're, so the intention is to make it a comprehensive um, coverage of a campus. Oftentimes with diversity programs, they will be, you will have a multicultural center over here and all of that diversity stuff happens over there. And there could be people on that campus who don't know anything at all about that diverse, that multicultural center are not interested in that multicultural center and they don't think it's in their lane. But I believe the most effective um, strategies for racial healing circles, at least for us, is that we encourage groups that represent difference within an institution to come together to talk to each other about matters that perhaps have never ever crossed their mind as being a, even appropriate to discuss. And again, we don't go in there with a sledgehammer and say, okay, let's talk about whether or not you are racist. We don't do that. But we do engage these individuals in cross different conversations about experiences. What does it feel like to actually show up in a room and you find out that you're the only one um, of your gender in the room? How does that feel? Or have you ever um, been, have you ever felt that you've been judged just by, just by the, your physical presence without someone even knowing who you were, right? All of us can say that regardless of race, but it's those kinds of questions that then get at this deeper understanding of what it means to be my, minoritized in an, in an environment, what it means to be, um, thought to be inferior on the basis of nothing else but your physical presence. And so when you engage in these conversations across difference on a campus, then you build a more, a community of empathy. And so that's what I think is different about what we are proposing with our strategies. And what I would add to that is how we're engaging in the work at Austin Community College is that we're not just inviting our students, our faculty, our staff, or even community members to workshops or trainings, but we're inviting them to be a part of the work by helping lead the work. Uh, so for us, what that looks like is um, a few weeks ago, we had Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Week at Austin Community College, and there were 12 virtual sessions, and all, all the sessions were either led by a faculty member, a staff member, a community member, or a student. Um, so this is them truly being partners in the work, helping to lead the work, and helping to lead the learning. And for, for me and from my perspective, the impact is different when you go to a training or workshop, which there's value in, but when you are truly a partner in the learning and you're helping to kind of distribute and administer the learning to the rest of the community, um, the impact is a little bit greater. So it's um, just, just giving places and spaces for our whole community to be a part of the learning and to truly um, implement it and be, um, be active in a different way. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, you know, to, back to this idea of diversity, um, I get worried sometimes that when we're talking about diversity, we're just talking about checking the boxes of different kinds of people showing up, not showing up fully, 
right? But just showing up to their, their physical appearance can help check a box or their ancestry can help check a box. And I think what, you know, um, both Kyrie and Cynthia are really speaking to is relationships, right? How are we going to be in relationship? And I think that's a really big difference than just the traditional conversation around diversity, you know, making sure the numbers are, are up to par. And so, um, and, and then, you know, again, I want, I, I really celebrate this idea of diversity, but how do we really bring our whole diverse selves that I don't have to leave most of who I am at the door. And, you know, especially in a higher education institution where someone that looks like me, you know, is, you know, how do I assimilate? No, how do I come? fully as a mother, as a woman, as a native Hawaiian, you know, all of these things that I'm going to bring and that they're going to be accepted in relationship with people who are different, you know? So I think that's maybe a little bit of the, of the nuances in that. We have a follow-up question here from the audience and I want to invite anyone in the audience who has a question to please feel free to put it in the uh, chat or the Q and A. But the question is, how do you recommend getting people to show up for these conversations who are somewhat scared or even resistant uh, I would say even also, you know, skeptical or or have kind of taken a, a position of enmity toward them. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll just start to say, I think there's a couple of things in that. The, the, the power of the invitation is really important, right? How the invitation is crafted, the intention behind the invitation, there's so much there. So it's a really important question. But also, how prepared are, are we, you, whoever, to invite, right? So... Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold a circle if I wasn't trained, um, you know, that's for example, right? And so I think there's a lot of preparation that has to go into the people who are gonna hold space and then the way we invite and with the way we prepare people to be together. So, um, you know, I, I, people at my university are often wanting to do things just like, you know, just because, you know, they, they feel the, they feel the, um, the call. And I wanna encourage that. And I wanna say, okay, how do we do this really well, right? How do we become really prepared? Because these are people's lives, right? That we are bringing together. So that's a beginning to that response. I would also say that a commitment to diversity and inclusion begins at the top for an institution. And it must in fact transfer from the top and from the bottom. And so it has to be a community commitment. Um, the leadership, you know, although we want to, we want to debunk some of the hierarchies in society, but we know higher education institutions are quite hierarchical. And it's important for the president or the whoever's in charge to say, this is something that we believe in because one of the, um, points that I always make when I go to colleges and universities and I'm doing either this work or some other work, I always pull out their mission statement. And most mission statements across the country say something about the commitment to diversity, inclusion, living in a global community. And so I pulled that mission statement. I said, okay, well, give me evidence of your commitment to this. And that the president is the leading cheerleader for the mission of an institution. So I will say just very practically that it has to come from the top, but with recognition that everyone, every person on that campus from the bottom up has to be involved in this community embracing of our commitment that we state, we say that we have a commitment. So this is how, this is one of the ways that we do it. And so that's, that would be my advice to institutions of higher education. I would just uh, echo Dr. Cynthia. I, I would say that it, it definitely has to be a top-down approach. I know that uh, my chancellor, Dr. Rose, whether I'm in the room or not, um, when it comes to equity and inclusion, he's talking about it because it's his number one priority out of our top three strategic priorities. And I know because people, my faculty, my staff, my whole community are coming to me and, and, and reaching out to me to engage with me because it's being championed by, from the top. So that's so important. It can't just, it can't be um, part of our mission, but not something we're truly living and investing in. Um, and, and you, as a person that does equity work, you, you know what that feels like when it's not truly supported. And, and that's something I'm proud about in my institution. Then beyond that, I'd, I'd also say um, the, the culture really has to be um, kind of um, developed in a way where, where people are willing to engage in their truth because they know and understand that it's, it's the expectation is that, that it's going to be 
um, kind of free of kind of blame, shame, or guilt, but truly an environment where we all can learn in. Um, for, for me and how I approach the conversation, it's not a black issue, not a white issue, brown, purple, or um, re really, it's not really about your, your culture, or your racial ethnicity. It's about the fact that as human beings, we make these mistakes. I mean, implicit bias is real, stereotypes are real. Um, and, and, it, and it happens because we, we've all, in various ways, received see these messages and that we don't often we don't always realize impact us and impact how we interact with people. Uh, so uh, there's power in me being able to share my story, but it's power in me being able to share some of the mistakes I've made and what my journeys look like um, when I'm engaging with students and faculty and staff. And for, for me, that helps to open up the conversation for people to uh, be willing to talk about their truths, to, to admit um, some areas they need to work in, but it has to be an environment where that's accepted, where people can ask questions, where people can make mistakes, um, but, but uh, be, in, be in that space and know that it's going to be okay and it's going to be encouraged um, because we're all learning. Bunihe, you mentioned uh, the importance of the invitation. Um, and we have this question, you know, how do you get people to be in the room who need to be there? I mean, do any of you find that this kind of um, process, that this kind of training, this kind of experience can work when people are forced to be there when it's like mandated and you know they kind of come in with that attitude like they're checking a box i don't think so um i, I don't think so i think you have to be willing your heart has to be there and i want to say that i think there's you know um when, when the power of the invitation i think at least where i come from you don't invite someone until you have a relationship with them and so you know before even you know it, there's there's a you know degree of kind of variety of relationships you might have with someone but it begins with being in relationship with your students, with your staff or faculty, with your community, with your administration. Um, I can say at our university at UH Manoa, over the last three years, one of the things we did was um, pilot um, kind of a process that we created. And so, you know, we did it separately with students and staff, faculty, and also executive administration for a number of different reasons. But um, the team, my team, you know, um, it, 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 for the executive administration uh, space, you know, we invited basically everyone that that was in that that cohort, um, you know, that has that label at our university. But we, I also knew if they didn't have a relationship with me, right? So also the way they see me, they see the people who are holding the space, then they weren't going to come. And sure enough, right? If I didn't, if you know, if our relationship was just uh, just starting out, they they didn't come. And I can't blame them for that because they want to feel safe too, right? And they're not going. How are they going to trust us to hold space if? Um, you know, if, if they don't know me well enough, right? If they can't, if they can't trust that I'm going to keep a, a safe space for them. So I think that's really important. I, I would never mandate someone to be at a circle or at an, at an event um, because if they're not ready to be there, they're not going to be ready to be there. And that's going to actually cause harm to them, probably themselves, but also the other folks who are in the space. And I think I, we've also had experiences where folks have sh showed up kind of unexpectedly and come and, and show, and, you know, and been, been clear about their intentions. And there's also a space where we have to say, oh, you know, thank you so much, but actually that's not, that's not an intention of this space. And so we invite you to come back when you're ready, because that's not what we're going to be doing here today. That's hard work, but that's really important uh, care, you know, care work. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a really important question. And I, I really like the idea of being in relation. I think that's, I mean, that theme, I, I really, I love that. And I know that as we look at the difficulty of talking about um, issues of diversity, um, racism, um, you know, sexism, homophobia, all of these problems on college campuses that oftentimes you will sit around the table and you'll see the same folks, you know, and th these are the people who already, you know, they've already said, oh, yeah, this is a serious problem. You colleges and universities have had to initiate a number of policies that in some ways um, had to strongly encourage faculty and departments to do what was um, consistent with the goals of the institution to become more diverse. And so on some, some college campuses, for instance, with hiring committees, um, committees have to, have to demonstrate, they have to state why they did not interview certain individuals. They have to give a statement to justify 
passing over certain candidates. So that has become policy. And those kinds of policies have pushed the needle a little bit further on some campuses that needed a little extra nudging and in, uh, nudging to do the right thing that is consistent with the goals and the mission of the institution. So I think that we have to become very creative about how we engage folks who will not come. They're not going to participate. They will find it offensive, or as we see from the Boise State inc um, incident, that they are fragile. There's a level of fragility that exists among some of the individuals on those campuses where they don't wanna talk about, they don't even wanna talk about these issues. And so how do you address that? And at the same time, re um, respect the autonomy and agency of individuals. You, we have to be creative. So perhaps this work has to be built in to other kinds of initiatives that faculty are going to participate in across difference. So I think that we, you have to be very strategic at the same, the relationships are very important, but sometimes those relationships are only gonna have the same people in the room at the, all the time. And so how do we build the relationships, but also figure out ways to gently nudge or to strongly encourage individuals in order to be consistent with what, who we say we are as an institution, then we need you to, to do these things. And one of these things might be participating in conversations across difference. I mean, you know, we're educators. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to educate and grow. And this is a growth, this provides growth potential for faculty members and administrators and staff members on our colleges, college and university campuses. Yeah. So I, um, from my perspective, I, I believe us as adults, as professionals, um, we can often do our best to, um, to, to opt out of what's going to make us uncomfortable, which is like students do. Um, so I don't think voluntary is always the way because even though it's something we may need to we may need to grow as a professional if we know it's going to make us uncomfortable we may try to avoid it uh, so what we're doing at ACC is we're moving towards a model um, that combines two of our important principles one be, being that uh, professional development is important to us um, that as professionals um, we have to continue to grow uh, so we can continue to better serve all of our students um, at equity and then secondly the diversity equity inclusion is one of our top priorities um, so what the model we're moving towards is that as faculty and staff, depending on your status, you have X amount of um, professional development hours you have to do um, annually. And what we're looking at is that um, as a part of that plan, um, you would have, for example, uh, 30 diversity, equity, and inclusion um, offerings throughout the year, and you have to pick three or four. Um, so not telling, um, not telling our colleagues what they have to do, but telling them that it is an, it's important to us as an institution and it must be a part of your plan. Um, so that allows them some flexibility to pick what, what um, the areas that they're passionate about or need to grow in, um, but it, it doesn't allow them to opt out of it. And, and in that, we, we believe it just, it, it just, it just uh, reinforces that this is important to us as an institution and it reinforces that this is important, shouldn't be important, it should be important to us as professionals to continue to grow in that area. Um, but with, with that said though, when we are having this programming, it's not, it's not, um, it's not weird or, um, out of the ordinary for me to look up and see an executive vice president or to see a cabinet member or to see a chancellor or a provost at, at, at our these trainings and workshops because our leaders are role modeling this um, because it's important to us as an institution. To my mind, you know, this is where you know, the language of free speech is such a necessary partner in efforts at diversity and inclusion. And so, you know, it's always striking to me how how you know, when we're dealing with hate on campuses or other, um, you know, provocative visitors who are coming or, you know, difficult um, subjects, we've had a lot of people talking about the importance of free speech and, you know, working through that discomfort, the importance of being uncomfortable in college campuses, of learning, of growing, of being exposed to, you know, a diverse array of ideas. Um, uh, and I think that what is so striking about the Boise State example this week, but others that we're seeing that are talking about diversity around the country is how quickly all of those principles seem to, I don't know, exist in another universe. They don't seem to apply. And so, you know, it, if anything, it would be an opportunity to double down on the importance of 
uh, free speech and diversity and talk about how they go together and how they're kind of necessary counterparts. And, you know, people might be uncomfortable with some of these conversations, but uh, here's why, you know, we're having them. And here's the importance of free speech to the mission of higher education. I, I think these kind of principles have drifted apart, but this conversation reminds me um, just how close they really are. Um, I'm going to ask a, a few of the questions that we've gotten in the chat and some that I had prepared, kind of rolling them together here. On, on the topics of really getting into the practical work of the centers in responding to hate, for example, the recent rise in hatred against Asian, Asian American community and the violence in Atlanta, um, other campus conflicts that we've seen between students and faculty, you know, do any of you do restorative justice? Do you support that? Do you see your work as a, a form of that? Um, do you have any reflections on what universities can do more, um, both as a, you know, using healing as a process, both within the campus, but maybe also beyond between your centers, your institutions, and the wider communities in which you're located? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing, this idea of our, our holding on to this vision, right? So every TRHD campus um, goes through a process of articulating a vision that we have for the future. And really, like, it's hard. Like, you know, we've all been through the institutes where we're, we're, we're doing it ourselves and we're helping other campuses. But what is that vision of your future where racism has been jettisoned? And how do we take real and hold on to that? So the same way we're talking about mission, you know, driven universities, this vision of our future, we, it, that has to be front and center every single day, right? And kind of to the last question you were asking too about, you know, how do we get diverse folks to show up? How do we get, you know, and, and to Cynthia's point about, you know, some people, some places, the same people always showing up and how do we make sure there's more, how do we connect the dots for folks, right? And that is a hard job, right? That's a part of creating a new narrative or an expanded and more complete and complex narrative of where we are and where we're trying to go. And so <clears throat> a lot of the work we do, I, I've actually been really surprised. I have met more diverse people in the last three years in my work because of TRHT that I um, have never met before. And that is because we are holding on to a vision where we can all see, some, see ourselves in that future. And that's not, I'm not saying that's easy, but when we do that, right, I think you know, for example, we've been really talking talking about sustainability and climate change. And so a whole different group of people, you know, as, as we connect that with racism um, and really a healed future, a whole different kind of people have come to the table. Um, and so when we're talking about, yeah, and so when, when we talk about restorative justice and these other pieces of bringing these really kind of hard pieces together to heal, I think when we're, when we keep our eye, you know, keep our eye on the prize, really look at that guiding star um, it is a really important thread that in, that invites people into a new space. And so, yeah, we've been doing a lot of that kind of work, especially recently um, with what's happening on the U.S. continent, but also some really hard social issues that we are dealing with in Hawaii. Surprisingly, I know for some, but it's it's here. Um, we ha we have been doing a little bit of work um, out in the community. Um, Atlanta is a city that. It, um, it, it, like any other urban city is going through some gentrification, um, you know, concerns and issues. And um, so we did, we conducted in partnership with the YWCA of Greater Atlanta, we conducted a racial healing circle um, for one of our communities that's kind of establishing themselves. Um, you've got the individuals who are kind of identified as the gentrifiers and the individuals who have been living in these communities for you know years. Their family members have been living there for years. So we did one session with them and, um, and it really was like a, kind of a pilot so that they could see what, what um, these kinds of conversations would yield when you're talking about communities that are that where there are tensions between the newcomers and those individuals who have occupied the spaces. Um, I've been recently called to develop a program and so it's not, uh, it has not been actualized yet, but it's at a parochial school. You know, the places where you would think that these issues would not be present um, because of the mission, you know, so mission driven but it's at a parochial school where there've been um, problems between the um, Hispanic and black students. And so we are coming in there, not so much 
in some ways, yeah, restorative justice in a, in a big way in terms of just really engaging the students in conversations. And again, the point to that group was a racial healing circle is not going to be it that you're going to have to add some other components to it, you know, reading and book discussions and, you know, having other ways that you can, can touch the mind and the heart. And so um, I do believe that there is a future for this work um, in the restorative justice vein um, in partnership with other projects that are engaged in restorative justice. But um, first, the most difficult, the most difficult part of it is that just really acknowledging that the problem exists. And once we can get individuals to acknowledge that there's a problem, then we can move forward. And um, so I'm hopeful about the TRHT model. Um, as you all know that, you know, it is being considered as a national model. And so I, I'm very hopeful and, and maybe Tia can say something about that. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah, I mean, I think in higher education, this is a place that, uh, where students are, should be able to learn and make mistakes and grow from that. Um, so I believe firmly in restorative justice, um, but I also believe that we have to have um, equitable and just uh, policies and practices. Um, so what I mean by that is that we, we have served institutions that had zero tolerance policy, policies as it relates to something like marijuana, um, but then a student who commits a blatant act of racism or intolerance, um, something like that occurs and we had, wanna have a conversation about restorative justice and keeping that student. Um, so I think it has to be balanced and I think that we have to truly have some candid conversations about what our principles are and make sure that there's some alignment there because the way we, enforce our policies, apply them to, um, to different students. Uh, it's, it says something to our community. It says something to our students about what we value. Um, so I think that we just need to have those conversations and we need to have students and faculty, staff, even community partners at the table when we're having um, discussions about our policies and practices to make sure there's some alignment there. Because yes, students should be able to make mistakes, but we have to, it has to be some balance in terms of how we apply, apply these things we've come full circle to the issue of equality once again and, and consistency uh, in policies and how we talk about this. All right, I'm gonna wrap two of the final questions here kind of together and see if any of you have any comments. Um, but so one was there was a question in the uh, Q&A here about whether any of your centers have worked with um, student disability centers or scholars of disability and how you've tried to work with them, uh, particularly when those issues intersect with issues, I think, of uh, uh, racial healing equity in historically marginalized communities. Um, and then the second question was advice for students. We had a few questions here, um, you know, about classes or ways in which students can become uh, more involved, become practitioners or ambassadors for some of this work, uh, be able possibly to train other students. Uh, and similarly, um, what do you think that is that that in particular students could do to help move institutions forward, I think, from that moment of, you know, box checking and, you know, putting out statements to, you know, taking actions uh, for building, um, you know, more, more, I think, more inclusive and more uh, equal communities on campus. So any responses to either of these questions? Um, I can speak to the disability um, question. Um, the last high school that I worked with, it was important for them to for me not to name what we were doing racial healing they said that would you name it intergroup healing and so i said yeah i can name it intergroup healing you know we're going to still use the same principles but they did that because they have a very diverse student body and ability was important and so in the prompts because we use prompts in the discussion prompts i included a prompt that talked about, um, that included individuals um, based on ability. Have you ever witnessed any form of direct discrimination against a person on the basis of, And I, I, but I listed ability first, ability, gender, and I listed all of those. And it was interesting in the reflect, when the groups went into their breakouts, that became a major point of discussion because someone talked about having a sister who was disabled and the ways in which that sister had been treated um, or not or not included 
But from that general discussion about ability, we were able again to look across difference because again, we all are othered in one way or the other. And so you build empathy so you can experience what well, you could be sensitive to that, you could also be sensitive to someone being other for other characteristics. So we have dealt with that as an issue, as a concern. Um, I'll just speak to how we engage students. Um, one of my goals um, for this time next year is to have at least uh, two to three uh, student ambassadors that will, that will be a part of my, my staff. So will be helping to lead the work, to have them promote the work and be out front and center. And I think that model works because I, as I think about uh, TRHT week that I referenced a little bit earlier, one of the sessions that we've had some of the greatest feedback from was our equity and uh, equity and justice, uh, equity, justice and, and policing conversation that was led by four of our Austin Community College police officers and three ACC students. They were all in the panel. They were all having this conversation. They were all for out front and center. It wasn't me, it was them. And uh, as student, when students are partners in the work, um, I think that it's even more impactful and even, even greater learning opportunity for them and a way for them to develop as leaders. And other students will, as cool as I think I am, other students will listen um, quicker and, and maybe, um, more attentively when, they're, when their peers are, are out in front and center and promoting this conversation and leading this conversation. So I just think it's a way for us to make them true partners, but also a way to help them develop and develop their voice and develop them as leaders that we want them to be. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, students have such a powerful voice on campus, right? Especially when it's a collective voice. And so if there are places, if there are campuses that, you know, if you're, if you're a student on a campus and this isn't your situation yet, call out for it, you know, make it known to your leadership that this is what you're yearning for and you're looking for. Because um, I know on our campus, you know, when students, when students rise, um, you can't, you can't ignore them. And they have more power than, you know, staff and faculty in so many ways. Um, and, you know, I think, and I'm sure Tia is going to talk about this when, as we wrap up, but that's the point of the TRHD campus centers is to is to grow the next generation of leaders who are going to do this work right and so students have to be at the heart of this and if we're not students if you're listening call us on it that is your job you know call us we are here we are getting paid to to serve you to prepare you um and so i think that's just you know a really important point that and so great question thank you mm -hmm. yeah all right so i turn to you tia you know, uh, there was a question here also about what folks can do after the circles and how the, this work of the centers um, extends beyond these. So maybe if you have any thoughts about that or uh, wanted to end with anything about where this effort by AAC and you is going next. Sure, and I just wanna say thank you to our great, excellent TRHC Campus Center leaders and to you, Jonathan, and PEN America for partnering with AEC and you on the common room today and inviting us to be part of your efforts. So thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things on the students. The students are actually very much engaged in what Cynthia was mentioning on the national development of a TRHT commission. So there's resolution within the House and within the Senate by Senator Cory Booker and Congresswoman Barbara Lee to have a national TRHT commission. And students I've already been contacted from, from many places, many institutions across the country that are galvanizing that they're coming part of that effort. Students are a core part of this work. We, we say this, we did this because of them and building for better, just and equitable communities as for them in our future. Um, AAC and you, our goal is to have 150 TRHC campus centers. We're on that journey. Every year we have the TRHC Campus Center Institute that happens in June, where institutions can apply and be engaged with leaders that are mentors right here, represented right here on this webinar today, and many other the TRHT campus centers where they can learn about the framework and engage in this work. We want to grow. We want this, this work to be in every community across this country. And the, to focus on racial healing and transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. And I hope those in our audience will join me in thanking all of our fantastic panelists today. It's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed the opportunity to learn more about the TRHT centers and to talk about these issues with all of you. I end the common room today with a quick plug in the chat for a program that we are running at Penn America for college and high school students starting at the end of the month uh, for the month of April, meeting twice a week 
looking at issues of global free speech and human rights around the world. They'll be doing deep dives into case studies and pressing issues in authoritarian countries and how we support, in particular, writers, artists, and other uh, scholars and other creatives, um, uh, people engaged in creative, uh, uh, you know, creative expression uh, in defending their rights and standing up for their human rights. So if you know any young people interested in human rights issues, please do help us spread the word. And thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you.